Morning everyone, welcome to worship this morning. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Uh, I'm going to start with a psalm and then we'll pray and then the service will continue. So this is Psalm 95 verses 6 and 7. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can have this time together in your presence. Even though we're apart in different rooms, join us all together through your spirit. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you that we know your presence, that we know you are here. We commit all that we do this morning into your hands. Amen. Amen. The Bible reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 to 21. So I bow in prayer before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth gets its true name. I ask the Father in his great glory to give you the power to be strong inwardly through the Spirit. I pray that Christ will live in your hearts by faith and that your lives will be strong in love and be built on love. And I pray that you and all God's holy people will have the power to understand the greatness of Christ's love, how wide and how long and how high and how deep that love is. Christ's love is greater than anyone can ever know, but I pray that you will be able to know that love. Then you can be filled with the fullness of God. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome to today's episode of the Great Berniston Bake Off. Today, the contestants in the tent will be facing their most tricky technical challenge yet. A chocolate mug cake. measure. Hello. She can measure all sorts. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is that they might understand how wide, how long, how high and how deep God's love really is. You might be able to help us with that Mrs. Measure. Mm -hmm. mm. Let's see, can we measure God's love? I know Let's try using what you used to measure out the flour with. You used a measuring spoon or a scoop, didn't you? A measuring scoop. Hmm. Maybe something a little bit bigger? Okay, it's a little bit bigger. Like a measuring cup, isn't it? Could help you maybe find just the right amount of flour for your recipe mm -hmm. or the amount, right amount of sugar but Psalm 23 tells us my cup runs over with God's blessings of love they can't be measured they can't be measured with a cup it would just overflow hmm 
okay, well, what about measuring tape? Because God says that in the Bible, it says that God's love is high and deep. And if we want to measure something high, we usually use a measuring tape, don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, but Psalm 108 tells us that God's love is higher than the heavens. Will your measuring tape go that far, Mrs. Measure? I don't think so. Oh dear. Right. Well, maybe what we could do then is measure how long, how long God's love will carry on for. So what could we use for that? A clock. Okay, do you think a clock will help us to measure God's love? How long lasting it is maybe? In um, When you made your mug cake, you had to use the clock on the microwave to measure how long your mug cake had to be in for, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Oh, but Psalm 108 also tells us that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. Will your clock measure everlasting? I think it would have run out of batteries by that time. Oh dear, we can't measure God's love, but we can experience it. So our prayer for you today is that you might know how wide, how long, <laughs> how high, and how deep God's love really is. May you experience it, though it is so great that you will never fully understand it. So we're thinking today about um, that uh, prayer of Paul for the Ephesians. Um, Ephesus, as you may know, was quite an important town on the, well city really, on the west coast of what is modern day Turkey. Some of you may have been to Turkey on your holidays and uh, it's still there as a ruin and a little church was established there quite early on. And uh, Paul is praying this prayer for the Ephesians, um, but actually he was praying, praying it for more than just the Ephesians, but also uh, if you look at the first a um, couple of verses in the first chapter mm -hmm. of Ephesians, it says that it's to the saints of Ephesus and all the faithful in Christ Jesus. So that in effect means us. It means everybody, all the, all the people here at, um, at Horsker uh, today and the people at Burniston, because this service is being recorded, um, we're going to have it at Burniston uh, next Sunday when we're looking at this particular prayer. So um, N.T. writes the quite well-known Bible scholar who used to be the Bishop of Durham, um, he believes that uh, Ephesians was probably a circular letter, not only to the Ephesians but also to other churches in the area that Paul didn't know. He was very, um, he was, he was very um, fond of the Ephesians because he'd spent nearly three years ministering among them personally. They were like his children, if you like. Uh, but there were lots of other churches in the vicinity where he didn't know them, but was just as concerned for them as he was the Ephesians. So it's believed that this was a circular letter that would have gone to quite a number of different churches and uh, would have also been seen by the church in Ephesus as well. Uh, and that's probably quite appropriate that I'm preaching a sermon on it to the church here at Horska and the church at Burniston, and indeed anybody else that might be tuning into this on uh, YouTube uh, next week. So we are the faithful in Christ Jesus in the 21st century. Um, and this letter, we believe, was written from a Roman prison cell. Uh, the traditional view is that it was written around about 61 AD, but some scholars believe it could have been written as late as 67 AD, probably just before Paul died. But whatever, whenever it was written, it was at the time Nero was the emperor, so Christians were being given a hard time of it, and it was going to get even worse. And um, 
This is Paul's impassioned plea to the churches to stand firm in Christ and to stick with the faith that they, they first knew. And so, just to give a little uh, breakdown of the letter to the Ephesians, it falls into two sections. The first section uh, is chapters 1 to 3, and that really is a summary of the gospel message that Jesus died, he rose again from the dead, and uh, he ascended to be with his Father, and then he sent the Holy Spirit to be with those who placed their faith in him. And that basically he died for our sins, we can't earn our salvation, Jesus has done it all, all we can do is to have faith in him and trust in him and be thankful for all that he's done for us. And then the second part of the letter, um, chapters 4 to 6, that sets out how that gospel message should impact on our own lives, should shape them so that out of thankfulness for what Jesus has done for us, um, it results in good works and also in the final chapter, standing firm in the Lord and putting on the, all the armour of God to be able to withstand the devil's evil schemes. So that basically is the structure of the letter to the Ephesians. And we find this little prayer occurring virtually halfway through between the two halves. So it comes just at the very end of chapter 3. And um, it's, it's a well-known doxology. You'll have, heard it, um, you'll have heard it probably said at the end of some services. Um, and it's that the believers will be filled with the Holy Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's verses 16 and 17. Now the structure of the little section we're looking at, which is just verses 14 to 21, uh, we've got an introductory couple of verses, verses 14 and 15. We've then got the prayer itself, which is verses uh, 16 to 19. And if you do have Bibles open in front of you, or if you're looking at it on your mobile phones, you may find it quite helpful to see that. And then at the end of the uh, section, there's this doxology, uh, this ascription of praise to Jesus um, at the end, verses 20 and 21. So we're going to look first of all at the introduction um, and note that Paul is saying this prayer kneeling, which is quite unusual because the standard uh, posture, if you like, for saying a prayer by Jews or the early Christians would be to stand with open hands like this, probably looking up to heaven and addressing the Lord in prayer in that way. But uh, we do get various instances in scripture where people do kneel and um, it's, it's significant that Paul is kneeling in this instance in a real really impassioned prayer of entreaty for the Ephesians that he really feels for and the other churches round about him really wants to hear the, the, the Lord to hear this prayer by him on their behalf. It's the posture of somebody in complete humility at the end of their own resources who is just turning to God. Don't forget Paul was a prisoner in Rome and so there was nothing he could do physically himself but he brings it to the Lord and says, Lord, my prayer for them is this and then goes on to pray that they will stand firm in him. I can remember kneeling in prayer with tears actually the, many years ago the, uh, the day that the doctor told my wife and I that we would not be able to have children. There was just nothing we could do about it it was something we brought before the Lord in prayer. And we were very blessed that he, he answered that prayer for us. We're told that Jesus knelt in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, so Luke chapter 22 says, actually Matthew 26 says that he, he fell on his face in prayer. It may be that the Lord did both. But it was again, he was thrown onto his father's resources, Lord uh, Father, not my will be done, but thine. It asked if the cup could be taken from him, but if it couldn't, then he wanted his Father's will to be done. And it was a time of great passion for him, and obviously uh, being thrown onto the resources of his Father. Uh, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, knelt in prayer. He was in the kneeling position as he was being stoned to death, asking, Lord, do not hold this against them. 
And if you go back into the Old Testament, Daniel prayed on his knees three times a day. Now Daniel was a person who was in a very high administrative position, but he was also up against it. Um, he was in a pluralistic culture quite different to his own. He trusted in the, the Lord God of Israel, and of course the Babylonians had all sorts of different gods, and though he'd been placed in this high position by Nebuchadnezzar, he could just as easily be toppled from it, as many fellow civil servants uh, attempted to do. You remember the Dan Daniel in the lion's den story. And so Daniel was conscious of the fact that he had to come before the Lord in prayer on his knees three times a day. He was totally dependent on God's resources. So there's no particular um, set position for prayer, uh, no prescribed posture. You can pray as much lying down as you can in a chair or um, you know, driving a car for that matter or on your knees, whatever. There's no special position. Um, but um, you may be able to think of times in your own lives when perhaps you've got down on your knees in prayer because things have been really difficult and you've come in humility before the Lord and you've brought your need before him because you've been at the end of your own resources. And that's the situation that we have here. Paul doing that for the Ephesians and for the faithful in Christ Jesus. And it's the state of the heart that's important. The, the act of kneeling is, I suppose, indicative of humility, but um, the Lord knows the heart. He doesn't like us to be arrogant when we come before him, and humility is really important. It's not something that is promoted a great deal in the culture in which we live today, because we're taught more to go for... Uh, you know, self-help and um, enabling people to do things for themselves and empowering them to do things for themselves, which is fine as far as it goes, but the Christian message is that we're all dependent on God for our being, and um, it isn't his intention that we should be completely independent. So it is, in many ways, a cross-cultural message to come before the Lord in humility on his knees and Paul's saying he comes before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. This is verse 15. And you are part of that family and I'm part of that family and uh, he's the Father. And sometimes we feel like prodigal sons and daughters that we don't quite come up to the mark and uh, we feel that when we, we turn to him in prayer, perhaps it's like a child coming back to a parent who's perhaps been away for a while. But um, it doesn't stop uh, Paul from praying that, you know, these people are part of God's family and that he's a father. And he wants us to know him as a father and recognise that we are children in his care. So Paul says, um, he says, out of his glorious riches... He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And uh, that's exactly what he wants to do for us. God, of course, is, well, he has inexhaustible riches. He, he uh, created the whole universe um, and he has riches to bestow on us. And it's sometimes very difficult for us to grasp what that means for us. I found quite a an interesting little illustration from a 19th century American preacher called J. Wilbur Chapman. He lived about the time of um, D.L. Moody. You remember Moody and Sankey hymns were quite popular at one time. And they came about during the revival in America at the end of the last century, the, well, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th. And J. Wilbur Chapman was a great preacher at that time. And he tells... Uh, that he was conducting a prayer meeting when a man gave this testimony. And uh, the man stood up, he must have been on a train journey, which ended up in Pennsylvania, because he said, I got off at Pennsylvania Depot as a homeless person, and for a year begged on the streets for a living. One day I touched a man on the shoulder and said, Mister, please give me a dime. As soon as I saw his face... I recognised my father. 
Father, don't you know me? I asked. Throwing his arms around me, he cried, I have found you. All I have is yours. Think of it, that I, a homeless person, stood begging my own father for 10 cents when for 18 years he had been looking for me to give me all that he was worth. And I thought that was quite an interesting illustration because it does show, it's a, it's a pale shadow in a way of what uh, the Father, our Father God does for us. But the Lord God, our Heavenly Father, he wants to be in the same relationship with us. I don't know how much money that father had, but obviously it was great for the son to suddenly find he had that amazing lot of resources that he never dreamt of having. But spiritually, we're in the same position. God is our Father, and he just as much wants to give us out of his uh, wonderful resources as that man did his son in that, um, in that testimony that he gave. He wants to, as Paul says, he wants to dwell in our innermost being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And of course, it is through faith that we know Christ at all. It isn't through any good works, but it's by faith and through the grace of the Lord that we're able to sit in this chapel this, this, today and to know that we are sons and daughters of the Lord himself, that we are saved and that we belong to him. Now verse 17 goes on to say, and this is the prayer, um, I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love, uh, I just want to pause there a minute because this is God's agape love. It isn't any other kind of love, it's the sort of love that I saw recently when my daughter-in-law gave birth to a little baby. She's only four weeks old, she's called Eve Betty. And just seeing Suzanne holding that little child up and the look of the mother to the child and so on, and, and, and the, the baby looking back at her. It's that kind of love, the love of a mother or indeed a father who will do anything for the child. They give up their life for their child, for their little baby. And again, that's just a picture as well, but it's a picture of the, 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 the soil, if you like, in which the roots uh, of faith are grounded. And Paul's, Paul goes on to say, and every gardener, indeed every farmer would know this, um, that the plants depend on their roots to, well, A, keep upright, and B, to draw nutrients and water and sustenance from the soil. The roots are out of sight underground um, and maybe they don't seem that important. Maybe we grow flowers, hanging baskets, what you will, you know, because of the lovely colourful flowers or the, you know, the grain that grows up in the field. Uh, and of course that's right, but the the roots are equally, if not more important, because without them, we wouldn't have those lovely flowers or that beautiful grain that has to be harvested in due course. And Paul's prayer is that we are grounded in Christ, that our roots go deep down into him, that we are upright spiritually, that we are well nourished spiritually. And of course, the soil is important because it has to be constantly watered and we know from our hanging baskets in our garden this summer that if you don't water them the uh, the plants dry out the roots go well if there's no water they just simply go dry and the plants flop and eventually die and they look awful but what a contrast if they're well watered and they are a, a riot of color in the hanging basket and it's a picture again of how important it is to be rooted in Christ. I mean, Jesus says, I am the vine, in John chapter 15, that we need to be connected with him. And if we're not connected to him, we can do nothing. But if we are connected, we have all the riches that come up through the soil, through the trunk, through the branches, which we are, and we give, uh, we give out the fruit, uh, in this case, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, patience, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruit that grow from a person who is connected to the Lord Jesus. And, um, and of course, uh, in another part of John's Gospel, chapter 4, we're told about the living water when Jesus met with the woman at the well. 
and the conversation took place between them where she said, sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. And Jesus said, you know, if you knew the person who was asking you for water, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And then she says, sir, give me that water. And it ends up because of the living water of Christ with that woman's life being completely transformed. She goes back to the town from which she's come and tells them, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. And Jesus goes into the town and the people welcome him, the Samaritan town, and they prevail on him to stay with them for two or three days, which he does. So this is the difference that Jesus makes being grounded in his love, but also uh, partaking of the living water um, that we're to uh, enjoy, uh, the blessings that he has to give by, by experiencing. So grounded, firm and deep in the Saviour's love, it comes in one of our hymns, doesn't it, with your anchor hold? And that's probably the, the biblical passage from which it comes. Verse 18, Paul prays that we may have power together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now we know from Genesis chapter 1 that God created the heavens and the earth, and it goes on to say that he created the sun and the, star, the, sun and the moon and the stars. In fact, he created the whole universe, and scientists tell us that the universe is um, spherical in... Um, in form as it were, and uh, it's in the nature of a sphere, it's 45.6 billion light years in radius, which means it goes 46.5 billion light years that way, that way, that way, and that way. It's enormous, and it's so enormous that we can't grasp it, we can't get our minds around it. And yet the love of God in Christ Jesus is even bigger than that. And that is why Paul is saying he wants us to be able to grasp that truth. Um, how much Jesus, how much God loves each one of us. Um, to appreciate that, it is immense, but his love for us is immense. And Paul's prayer, this is verse 19, is that we know this love that surpasses knowledge. Uh, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now knowing it, it surpasses knowledge. Uh, knowledge, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, you know, Paul says there, as for knowledge, it will pass away. But at the end he says there are these three things, faith, hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. And that's right, because love endures, and love is the soil in which our roots are to be uh, sunk and grounded. So that's the prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians and for all who are in Christ Jesus. That means you and me in the 21st century as well. And then the prayer concludes with this little doxology in verses 20 and 21. And I've handed out little um, slips. I hope Malcolm's got one, um, which we're going to recite at the end of this. But before we do, I just want to look at those two verses, 20 and 21. Now to him, that is Jesus, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is the power of the Holy Spirit, that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church. That's the church here at Horsker. That's the church in Burniston. That's the church in Scarborough, the church in Whitby, the church anywhere where saints are tuned into the Lord, wherever they are. Because, of course, the church is not the building, it's actually the body of believers trusting in the Lord Jesus. And he says that there'll be glory in the church um, and in Christ Jesus. That's obviously Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died and was raised from the dead for us so that we can know new life in him. And it's to be throughout all generations. Now, in meditating on this, I was thinking back to generations long gone. You'll be thinking of different people to me, because if this church goes back to 1831, 
and there'll be a lot of saints who've worshipped here over the years. My mind went to my uncle Tom Hartley, 60 years ago. He was a great uncle, a saintly man who lived on Shipley Glen in West Yorkshire and went to Saltair Chapel. And they had a saying, uh, and that was, you know, Betty, David, Paul, with a lot to be thankful for. And he used to come out with this saying when people were perhaps inclined to moan a little bit or maybe not be as grateful as they should be for the circumstances that were, they were in. So he'd say, with a lot to be thankful for. And it was another way of saying, count your blessings, count them one by one, and it will amaze you what the Lord has done. Because that's what he has done for us. And those are, he's obviously an example of a, a, a saint, a great uncle of mine that died many years ago. Uh, if you go back to Wesley or Luther or to the early church fathers, even further, people who fought the good fight. But it isn't just that, it's for all generations, it's for the generations that are coming about now, it's for our own generation here and now, those of us here today in this church, but it's also for the up and coming generation. I was thinking about my little granddaughter Tabitha who's three years old. She has a book that she loves us to read to her. It's called The Cutie Fruities and it's all about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And she can tell you all about Lily Love and Sally Self-Control and Katie Kindness and the others. And it's wonderful for me to be able to see the glory of the Lord, not only in generations gone by, not only in the church in our own generation, but also in those generations that are coming up and stretching into the future. So it reminds us that we're part of a great church, a great universal church, the church triumphant um, uh, in, in heaven, the church militant on earth, uh, doing our bit. And that's why Paul is saying that it be the glory, of the, the glory of the Lord be in the church throughout all generations for ever and ever. Amen. So to deal with the uh, doxology, I thought we could do a little better than actually read it together as an ascription of praise to Jesus. So let's do that. If you've got it in front of you, we'll say quite slowly together the doxology from verses 20 and 21 of uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our prayers for today's service. Thank you, Paul, for delving into the depths of this beautiful prayer for the Ephesians and opening our hearts and minds to how the Lord would want to touch us with his love today. Before we go into prayer, I'd like to share something with you that I shared at our meeting in Harwood Dale a few weeks ago at our Thanksgiving service for David. It was a picture that Joyce Kennywell was given by the Lord. Joyce went to be with him a few months ago, just at the beginning of lockdown. But it was a really vivid picture. And as a stewards, we've worked out um, our strategic prayers that we're bringing in each week um, into the church's life. It struck me that actually Joyce's picture is very much a time for today. She had a picture of a tree and on the tree, were fruits and they weren't quite grown they were very small fruits and the thing with it is that she saw roots going deep down and those roots needed to be established we needed to be rooted um, and established in love maybe which is what the Ephesians prayer was about but those roots had to go down deep and when they'd gone down deep then the fruits could start growing well, as part of um, putting this prayer, this weekly prayer together, when we had a small group who gathered to discuss it a bit further, it was decided, well, 
it was prompted, a couple of people were prompted to say, we need to involve the fruits of the Spirit. And so each week we are praying into a fruit of the Spirit. So I just feel that this picture of Joyce's and the, and the first psalm as well, where it talks about a tree whose roots go down deep into the, into the water of the stream, that holds strong and firm and is grounded in God's word, that this is very much a picture for our time right now. And I wanted to share that with you, to encourage you that whatever is happening at the moment in our lives and in the lives of the church, if we stay firm and secure in the truth of God's word and listen to him through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will grow those roots of love and faith and trust and dependence on him and confidence in God, the confidence that David spoke about a few weeks ago in his last sermon. So hold that picture of a tree, hold that picture of the fruits of the spirit dwelling in and growing in us as we go into prayer today. So Lord, let us pray. We know, Lord, that when we are truly kneeling in prayer, whether actually kneeling or kneeling in our spirit, we have come to the end of ourselves. And we come to you in humility, knowing that certain things in our life, well, all things in our life, actually, not just certain things, but all things in our lives need to be brought before you. And then we can truly ask and pray. And why do we want to bring everything to you? What will come from this? Well, if we take Paul's words today, we will be strengthened with power through your spirit, Lord, in our inner being. And that strengthening in our inner being will give us that fortitude to know that we can say we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. All the way through your word to us from Christ, from you, Jesus. It's about being strengthened in love strengthened in faith, strengthened in truth. So Lord, we just take a moment now and ask you, Holy Spirit, to come into each one of us now, wherever we are, whatever our circumstances, come and strengthen us in our inner being. And what will come from this, Lord? Lord, we're praying that you, Jesus, will dwell in our hearts through faith. A faith that may start as a mustard seed, but will grow into, well, a mustard tree is one of the biggest trees there is. A huge tree that, but, and that's what we want to be, Lord strong in our faith, but rooted and established in your love, Jesus. A love that takes action, a love that forgives, a love that is over all circumstances, over anything that may be thrown at us, any illness, either physical or mental, any hardship, through losing work, through having uncertainty about the future, through losing loved ones. We can bring everything to you, Lord. So in a moment, again, we just wait on you, Lord, to heal us and make us whole in those places that might be hurting right now. In those places where fear has taken root. We don't want fear. Pull out fear. And be rooted in Christ's love. Come Holy Spirit. Come bring in that root of Christ's love. I 
now as we receive that from you, that strengthening, that empowerment, that experience of your love in our lives, where can we go from here? Lord, we think of this week ahead. Where can we be giving of your love? Where can we serve with your love? Where can we care with your love? Where can we pray with your love? Where can we listen? Lord, be with us. Give us opportunities to share your love to the loveless, share your love to the lonely, to the needy, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Help us to walk after you, Christ, in this way. Give us those opportunities. And I want to share something else as I pray. There's a lot about banners in the Bible. And recently, some friends were praying with me for someone who's in need. And I had a picture of a banner of God's love being over this person. And you know, things have moved. That situation has improved. So can we pray now a banner of love over situations, over places, over people that we know need a touch of Christ's love? Let's pray his banner of love over them right now. Whether it's someone we know, a matter locally, a matter nationally or a matter internationally. And as we look outward now, can I just share with you this week's strategic prayer? Or prayer for Berniston Church. Maybe that sounds better. Well, it's from Mikai. And it says here, this is the word that we're praying into. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And this passage we, t we chose because we want to pray into our community. Lord, we lift up our community of believers in Scarborough to you and along the East Coast. Lord, there's a lot said about revival being here, about your spirit being powerful along this coast. So we pray into that, Lord. We pray for more revival. And practically, we pray for all our local communities. We pray for our local government in the council that they would have wise wisdom in their decisions and act wise and justly. We pray for our local businesses that they would love justice and act just justice just act justly equally that they would balance the scales that they would work honestly and that you would bless them, Lord, that you would bless and prosper the businesses which are striving to stay afloat at the moment. And if any are now local people are struggling, facing redundancies, Lord, would you be their strength and will you make a way forward for them? Lord, we pray for our schools and our health service. Yes, Lord, that they would love mercy that they would have strength as well. All the teachers and children going back to school, we pray for them as they prepare in this next week. We pray for the hospitals. We pray for their systems to work well and that they may be ready for any new outbreak of the coronavirus. But you know, Lord, I just want to pray that it's going to be mild in Scarborough. It's going to be mild along this East Coast, that you're blessing us with health and well-being, Lord. Lord, we pray for our government. We pray for all the decisions that will need to be made in the coming weeks and months ahead. Again, we do pray for wisdom for you, for them and for your spirit to hover over our nation, holding back any darkness or anything that seeks 
to cause chaos and disorder and disease. No, we lift up this banner of truth and love over our nation right now in Jesus' name. And finally, we pray for the whole world. We pray particularly for the persecuted church throughout our nation, throughout not well throughout our nation, but throughout the whole of the world. Lord, we pray that you would give them the strength, you would give them the perseverance, that you would bring aid and relief to them through the Christian organisations that stand in these times. And we pray for your mercy upon our world. We pray for that, we pray for the peace that comes with the Prince of Peace, the peace that passes all understanding. And we say, come Lord Jesus, come. Come again into our world and bring the new heaven and the new earth that is awaiting, awaiting in the future. So as we finish our prayers, we look to you, the God of hope, the hope that is an anchor to our soul individually, a hope for the nations and a hope for the world. Come Lord Jesus, come now and come again. And it's in your mighty name we pray. And as ever in these times, I just say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn to you with his grace and his favour. May he lift his countenance to you and grant you that peace that passes all understanding. Amen. <laughs>